Welcome to Conversations with Elizabeth Ellen Carter. It is my absolute delight and pleasure to introduce you all to Phil Reed. Uh, Phil is the 2021 Dragon Blade Right Stuff competition winner, and I'm looking forward to having a discussion with Phil on that shortly. But we were talking about all the things we, we have in common, which is absolutely wonderful to discover when you chat with somebody for the first time. So this is this has been a, an absolute, absolute hoot to, to chat with you before we started recording. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's um, the first time I've done anything like this. So um, I'm a little bit nervous about it. <laughs> we, we were talking about, well, in in romance of course you've got your your what they call meet cutes and that is um what is the mechanism that brings the hero and heroine together for the first time and that can be done under a variety of circumstances um it could be a chance meeting in the street they could know each other for years and hate each other on site and and do all of those things and in romance it's really fun to then explore how how two people develop their romance to get their happy yeah. ever after in the end but it turns out that you knew you knew your husband for for years or sort of mixed in the same circles as children before you actually got together so, so tell did. us a bit more about that well my father and Patrick's father both worked at a place called AWRE which is the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment in Aldermaston in Berkshire and we both had to go to the same Christmas parties which I hated he didn't really like them very much either, but I absolutely hated the parties because I didn't know then I have Asperger's syndrome and I didn't discover that till I was an adult. But it explains a lot of things, such as why I didn't like socialising at a mass children's party. That is absolutely the worst thing you can do to an, uh, an Asperger's child is send them somewhere like that. So it was not fun. But. But having having mixed, did you actually meet meet at the party or did you meet no, again as adults? No, we didn't. We met again as adults because we've both been married before. And um, I was married to a farmer and I used to ride. We had a farm that backed onto a place called Snellsmore Common in Berkshire, which was beautiful for riding in. And I used to ride across it. There were a couple of bridleways that went across it, but you weren't really supposed to ride anywhere else. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> and we spent all our and my husband was what you call a countryside ranger he's um, his specialism is um ecology anyway he was working up there so I used to avoid him like the plague <laughs> because I, just, yeah, I didn't know he was going to end up being my husband and we, we used to avoid it we'd go and have a look and if his car was parked beside his office we'd go and ride where we wanted <laughs> Uh, it was quite fun and my husband my first husband died of leukemia when he was 36 it's a long time ago now and then I mean I'd known Patrick for a long time at that point but we just kind of got together after that and we I've got three children he's got one child and then we found we were having another one when I was 42 which was a little bit of a surprise oh wow oh. so we've got five between us and the youngest one is now 21 and he's at university. Oh, lovely. Lovely. What's so he we studying? have our lives back. Yeah, we have our lives back. <laughs> what's he studying? Which is why I can now write. Oh, oh excellent. So what's your son studying? Uh, film production. Oh, fantastic. But fantastic. he's got Asperger's as well. And I don't know mm. if you know anything about Asperger's, but all Asperger's have obsessions. Mm -hmm. His obsession is bell ringing which is mind-bogglingly boring. <laughs> because he doesn't just go and ring bells, he records bells and then expects us to watch the filming or listen to the recording of all the bells he rings. <laughs> so you can get in, have enough of a good thing. I mean, bells are lovely, church <laughs> bells are lovely, but you can have too much of them. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and in terms of your writing, did you always write or was it now having having your time back that, that spurred no. you on? I wrote from when I was about five. Mm -hmm. um, my mum and dad bought me, um, I think it was called a petite children's typewriter. I mean, obviously, it was a little manual children's typewriter. And somewhere my mother had the first story I ever wrote, but I don't know what happened to that. Oh. Um, and I'm, when I was a child, I was obsessed with ponies and horses and riding. And I just wrote lots of pony stories by hand, self-illustrated, um, 
on paper with no lines on it either. I've got one of those. <laughs> they were full of all sorts of terrible illustrations, and very naive writing, but quite fun. <laughs> and then um, when I got well, when I got into my teens, my mum got an electric typewriter and that was just such a boon. I taught myself to touch type and then I could write a lot faster, which was nice. I liked that. Um, but then when I, when I married my first husband, he was a farmer. I was running a riding school. There just really wasn't very much time to write. I did actually write a, a short story which got published in a magazine called Pony Magazine, which was the magazine that everybody got in those days when you, oh, you, know, wow. you were a horse and child. And I was very pleased it was, they, they wrote to me, I got £65 for it. <laughs> and it's a long well time done. ago. And um, they said, oh, we're going to publish it in the July issue. And when I bought the July issue, it was in a special, a summer pullout special. And it was alongside about three or four other stories by all the writers I'd read as a child. So I was side by side with them and I was very pleased. I don't blame you. That is a major achievement. Um, yeah. Now, I, I see from your website that your um, series uh, coming out with Dragon Blade is uh, Guinevere. But before we go into that, tell me how you discovered the competition. It was quite by chance, actually. I do enter a lot of competitions and I'd entered this particular story, book one of Guinevere, in um, it was the Sharp Books Histor Historical Writers Association competition about a year before that. And I'd come in the top six. So I thought, well, it's worth entering. I'll keep on entering. Mind you, it's quite a lot of money if you keep on entering competitions. And I mm. came across this one and it was free to enter. I just thought, oh, I'll enter it. So I did. And then I forgot all about it. And I come April, I think I entered it as soon as it opened. I just had a, a link to it and thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll enter that because it doesn't cost anything. Come April, I got an email saying, oh, congratulations, you're in the top 20. So I thought, hang on, wow, I'd forgotten about that one. So, and then it said that the results were coming out in July. And I thought, they're never going to pick me because my story is very historical. Um, it's, it's got a romance in it, obviously, but it is hor very historical. And it's a long time. It's not Regency and it's not Victorian, not even Highlander. It's a long time ago. So when it came to July the, the 1st and the results were coming out, I waited all day, but of course there's that time difference, isn't there? And it's, so I thought, I'd just send them a little email and ask them if the results are going to come out on time. Maybe there'll be a few more days. I got an email back from Sean saying, I won't give you the good news, but here's a link, watch it. Because it had come out about an hour beforehand. So I sat and watched it. <laughs> I screamed. <laughs> it got to me. Because as it was going through, she was going through all the winners, starting with sixth and fifth. And then she got to the first runner up. And as it went through, I was thinking, well, I think I'll probably just get an honourable mention. And then it got to me, I was like, ah, it's me, Patrick, it's me. <laughs> that, is, that is wonderful. And, and look, this is something I, I really do appreciate about Dragon Blade because my first title with them um, was Ancient Rome. So I went back a whole a lot further. Ago. Um, mine, what, mine was what period of Rome though? Um, it it was uh, third century AD. So yeah. we're talking about the uh, the reign of Maximinus Thrax. Ah. Um, and uh, um, I um, it was it was something that uh, uh, occurred to me. There there was sort of I, I wove some politics which which I I saw had sort of mod a modern day analog. And I'd um, entered that in, in some competitions, even though I'd, I'd had a couple of regencies sort of prior to that with another publisher, which I got the rights back for. Um, but I, I knew I had something really special with, uh, with Dark Heart. And um, I went to the Romance Writers of Australia conference. I had a pitch session with a, a number of, of editors. I had um, one of the major companies um, take, a, take an interest. Um, they wanted a, yeah, a partial, then they wanted the full manuscript. And I thought, this is terrific. And then I waited, and then I waited and waited and waited. And um, three months later, I followed up and again, six months later. Oh. And then I got the loveliest rejection letter saying, 
love the story, just can't sell the time period. And it's sort of, well, that's really disappointing. So I pitched it elsewhere. And at that point, Catherine had just started the Dragon Blade imprint. So I sent it to her on a whim. I was, I was weeks away from making the decision to go, you know what, I'll just self-publish it. If, if I can't get a publisher for it, um, I'll just do it myself. And then uh, a couple of days later, I get an email back from her to say, sort of, yes, she's, she's accepted the, yeah, the manuscript. And I, I tell you what, in, in the support of a wonderful publisher, um, you, you not only begin to quickly achieve an audience, but you also get a lot of support and a lot of camaraderie. And that's, it's not always the case with, with other publishers, but it most certainly is with Dragon Blade. So I can tell you, you're in a, a very safe pair of hands. Brilliant. That's really good. I mean, it's, it does seem very friendly from um, all the things I've joined on Facebook because I've, I've sent friend requests to other people, other other authors on from Dragon Blade. So, so I've got all um, all their all their contact details. I mean, it's I really enjoy it. It's lovely. Oh, and and every everyone is friendly and they're they're very active in in cross promoting too, which is. Uh, which is lovely, and I think that's that's what happens when you've got a leader like Catherine, who who um, she 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 walks the talk. Um, you know everything that she expects from her authors, she does herself, and yeah. and I think uh, that that attracts people who are of the same mind. So yeah. um, so you you see that uh, all the way through. Yeah, Sean seems really nice too, doesn't she? She is fantastic. To, um, uh, Sean is um, admin for Dragonblade for, for anyone watching. Um, the behind the scenes team at Dragonblade, um, Catherine has uh, assembled a fabulous uh, group of people with, uh, with Sean and Chris. And um, there's also, and, and I, I'm, I'm dreadful and I've, I've forgotten her name. So my apologies to all the people that I talk to as well. Elizabeth Kirk. Um, and there's a lovely lady who helps with the marketing too, whose face I can see. I've gone bl I've blank on, an, on the name. Mm. My apologies. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so give us an outline on the Guinevere series, because from what I've seen, there are three books. Well, no, there's five. Oh, <laughs> well, there's, oh there's five. I just they've saw three on the website oh, so far. Yeah, they've given me a contract for three books and presumably they'll see if they sell and then hopefully they might take the others. I don't know. I'm At the moment, I'm working on book five. Book four is all completed. Wow. And book five is halfway through. Um, but I'll tell you why I wrote them first, because uh, my husband's a keen photographer nowadays. Obviously, he's got a digital camera, but... Oh gosh, this is going back about 20 years, but I just never got round to writing it, it until a lot, the last couple of years. We went to Glastonbury Tour. Um, I don't know, do you know Glastonbury I Tour do. at all? Yes. Mm -hmm. We went to Glastonbury Tour and we parked around the back and he brought his camera and it was loaded up with infrared film, which picks out, the kind, I think it's the chlorophyll in, the, in, in grass and it gives a kind mm -hmm. of snowy look to the photograph. It's beautiful. Anyway. We walked towards the tour, he set up his tripod, took four photographs on the motor drive, so it was basically click, 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 like that. But we went, climbed up the tour, took some more photographs, went home. In the evening, he developed the film. And when he developed the film, he looked on the um, negatives, because he hadn't printed them yet. Um, he had his own dark room in those days. Um, and in the first photograph, you can see the mound of the tour with the ruined church tower on the top that's all that's left of the church mm -hmm. uh, and it's got no roof or anything anyway you can see it from a distance and there's a few trees it's a cloudy day but it's not misty in any way it's not a bright sunny day second photograph the tower is fading third photograph there is no tower fourth photograph the tower's back so we couldn't believe it he got it checked because his father who's now deceased was an optical physicist and he had the film checked to see if there was anything wrong with it and there was nothing wrong with it. Um, so I wondered if we mm. had a glimpse back in time at what the tower looked like before, that what the 
all looked like before there was a tower on top of it. And then I wondered what would happen if you were in the tower when it disappeared. Anyway, so my that was how it's, 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 that's, it. that's very Brigadoon in, in a way. It is a bit, yeah. Anyway, so um, Guinevere finally took took. Um, well, that was how it, it was seeded in my head because, and I'd always wanted to write a novel about King Arthur, but about the women in his life. And I thought about writing a book about all the women in his life, his mother, his wife, his sister. Um, and then I decided that I was going to use this thing that had happened to us on the tour. Um, and I had a, so Gwen, Gwen is a modern 21st century girl and her father, who's an Arthurian scholar, has died. So she goes to Glastonbury Tor on her own early one morning in November to scatter his ashes. She goes up the tour, gets into, she, she scatters his ashes um, and then she goes, she goes into the tower and she sees a ring on the floor in the corner. And as she goes to pick it up, she's snatched back in time to the dark ages because I figured that was how my story wanted to go. So she's 21st, 21st century girl in the Dark Ages. She's, she's been snatched back by Merlin because there's a prophecy that she will help Arthur become the king of legend. She has no intention of marrying him. Merlin says she has to marry him. So she's very much pissed off about this <laughs> and does not want to marry Prince Arthur. Even when she gets to meet him, he's quite sexy and handsome. <laughs> Obviously, you can't have an ugly hero, can you? <laughs> Um, so she's very much anti this all the way through and she gets kind of um, not bullied but she has to marry him in the end because the other alternative is marrying his awful brother and she definitely doesn't want to do that so she does end up marrying him of course she ends up loving him and she doesn't go back so she stays there because obviously the the second Patrick just said shh I mustn't say that but if there are three books she plainly stays there because book two is not about her going back to be a librarian again <laughs> Anyway, so that's basically the story. It's it's I met, I I've not written time travel myself, uh, but I, I do. There's several that I've read that I've, I've really really enjoyed. Um, it's it must be really interesting to to blend a character with with modern day sensibilities with that culture clash, and and it's yeah. sort of. I'm, I'm thinking of the the L.P. Hartley quote of the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. And and no more is that better explored than in a time travel romance. Yes. She's pretty horrified when she, the first night she's there, she's given a bucket in the corner in the corner of the room to pee in. So she has all sorts of things she has to face like that. Oh, um, my. Yes. And of course, she's got because she's come to Glastonbury with her boyfriend um, and her boyfriend gets left behind because he stays in the hotel when she she wants to go and scatter the ashes on her own. So, of course, when she arrives at um, it's not Camelot because Camelot isn't really that that's a medieval thing. She goes, she goes to live at South Canterbury Castle, which is mm -hmm. thought to have been the original of Camelot. So I've called it Din Cadden in my story. Um, which basically means the Fort of Cadden, because Cadbury is probably named after a king called Ca Cadden or Cadwy, and I've made him Arthur's brother. Anyway, um, so of course she, she gets given, she's in jeans and walking boots and um, a zipper jacket and a sweatshirt. So she's given their clothes to wear, and there's a maid who waits on her who's absolutely horrified when she sees her lacy underwear. So it's great fun playing about with that sort of thing. In in a way, it, it's good to have had Merlin there to, uh, because obviously he knows what he's doing. So to yeah. to e to ease her transition back into medieval life. Yes, it's not always all that helpful though, because although he's been he's actually been to the modern world, but he's only ever seen a tiny bit of it. So of course. I've had a few friends who've read it and they've said, well, don't they want to know about the future? And I said, well, no, because they probably think that the future she comes from is very similar to the present they're living in because the present they live in hasn't changed much. They're still using swords, they're still using horses. I mean, they've got no concept that you would end up with different kinds of weapons or transport or even houses because they've lived in those kind of houses all through the Roman, Roman occupation and well before it. So it's within, 
any kind of memory they've got, it's always been the same. So they're mm. not curious about the future. And so Merlin doesn't really know what's in the future because he's only ever seen really Glastonbury at all. So Look, that that makes a whole lot of sense because the um the rate of technological uh, technological change mm. um really only accelerated with the uh, the industrial revolution. Mm, it did, uh, didn't it? And and the development of, of steam engines. Uh, which fueled transportation, which had all of these flow on effects. Excuse me. Um, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. But in the the years prior to that, um, nothing much. The, mo the, mo the most the most the most exciting it. exciting thing mm. was was a a, a water powered mill, which the which the yes. Romans had. Yes, they did. Centuries yes. centuries before that, but yes. sort of as uh, sort of you know. Um, the collapse of the Roman Empire and then and then rebuilding civilization back um, to to something more organized in the uh, yeah. intervening centuries. The, the biggest problem when finds she has living mm -hmm. in the Dark Ages is because I made her father an Arthurian scholar. So Gwen has grown up. He's, she's named after Queen Guinevere um, because her father was an Arthurian scholar. So when mm -hmm. she goes back, she becomes Queen Guinevere. So it's kind of one of those chicken and egg things. She's named after herself. <laughs> um, but her biggest problem is she knows all the Arthurian legends. She knows as much history. She knows that she knows the romance stories. So she, what, one of the things she knows is about the battles that he fights. So for example, I don't know how familiar you are with um, Arthurian legend, but she knows about the Battle of Camlan, where he fights mm -hmm. against is supposed now she she has a big conundrum because she needs to fight she, she also knows the story that Medrout who is the modern Mordred is Arthur's son by incest I won't give that one away but that's part of the story and she also knows the story that he is the one that rebels against Arthur and they end up fighting at the Battle of Camlan and they both end up dead so she knows all this and she keeps seeing things happen all the way through the story and she doesn't know if she's meant to be there and everything she does is exactly in history or if she's doing things to change it or if she cannot change it whatever she does it will end up where it's meant to or can she change it oh that is really intriguing because then you've got explorations of of sort of free will and predestination as well mm. yeah um which yeah. also has me thinking how are you going to address the issue of Lancelot He's a medieval interloper. Oh, he does not okay. Come into it. No, he's medieval. No, there is no Lancelot in my books. It's really funny though because that's one of the questions. When I've got friends who've read it, they've gone, "Where's Lancelot?" And I've gone, "No, there is no Lancelot. He's French for a start, so he's not in my story." <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic! Um, she is so a tiny bit worried because the origin, the origin of the Lancelot story. Is with Medrout because Medrout is supposed to have seduced Guinevere and that's supposed to have and insulted her and that's supposed to have started the fallout with Arthur so she does know that you see oh. but she doesn't know if it's true or not and she thinks well it can't be true because um Medrout is a baby to start with and he's obviously an awful lot younger than her you see so but she's worried that something might happen and it might come true so there's all these things she's worried about poor girl Plus, she doesn't like water, and there's an awful lot of water about, because <laughs> in those days, Britain was very wet. I mean, I don't mean that it rained more. I mean, it just wasn't drained. So we're all in all the river basins and all the river valleys, there was marsh, and most of the rivers didn't have bridges. There were some Roman bridges, but a lot of them had fallen into disrepair. One bridge that's in very bad repair, she has to go over on a horse, and she's absolutely terrified. <laughs> so does not like water. Well, yes, I'm thinking of the the Romney marshes. I'm I'm thinking of the uh, the the marshes they were completely underwater uh, around the 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 Devon coast as as yeah. well. Well, um, it's quite interesting when you when you I love Google as a tool for research, and I I had to send them up to the River Clyde in Scotland, which is a place. There's a place there called Dunbarton Rock, mm -hmm. and back in the Dark Ages, it was called Dunbriaton, the Fort of the Britons. So she has to, they have to go up there. And I thought, well, how are they going to get across the river? There's going to be no bridge. So I Googled, there's a Roman ford. <laughs> <laughs> and I found it. 
So I knew exactly where it was. In your research, did you come across any surprises? Um, not so much, really, no, because I've, I've been researching King Arthur since I was very young. So I found more things out. I've got a series of children's books which are based around Arthur as well, that are not published. Um, well, they're kind of middle grade to slightly young adults. They're kind of like the Harry Potter age group would read, I would think. It's, it's about a 13 year old boy, modern, who inherits a, Excalibur. Um, and in that, I, as I was researching bits of it, I found interesting little legends that I didn't know about and that I could put in there. Like, for example, in, in the um, Guinevere books, I wanted a daughter for Guinevere. And I did research because I knew there were sons because that's, that's something that people don't know about. They go, did he have sons? And yeah, he did. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted a daughter for her and I found one. And I also found a little story to go with her. So that's going in my book. And I didn't know whether she really was a daughter. I don't know. It's probably some later story someone's added in because you don't know how much of it mm. is, even based on anything that is that far back because People just don't know if he was real or not, do they? Well, well, this is it, especially as somebody as iconic as as Arthur and as as fundamental um, to to the story of Britain. And it, it sort of the thought just uh, occurred to me that uh, um, the story of of Arthur and the and the Britons is as fundamental to to Britain as mm. the the story of Romulus and Remus are to the to the foundation of Rome. Yes. Yeah, I've been reading a very good book recently. I can't remember who it's by. Somebody Moffat, and it's called The Wall. Um, the Wall comes into Hadrian's Wall comes into book three. So last year we went up there for a visit because I'd never been to Hadrian's Wall. I mean, you can do a lot of research without going, but I like to visit the places I write about. So we went up last year in November, and we had a lockdown, so we had to come back early and didn't get to see everything we wanted. So I wrote the book from what I'd seen and, and a bit of imagination and, and research online. But we went back again this year because we booked it again straight away last year. So we went back again this year. And that was a really interesting trip. I really enjoyed that. There were so many things we could learn up there and I could put into my book. It was just wonderful. I am utterly, utterly envious. I really, really am. Because, of course, uh, for me, it's online research yeah it's so, a long way uh, away for you Listen, have you been to rome i haven't i, I haven't a, oh, before i had jake so more than 20 years ago but it was amazing really you should go if you get the chance my dream Especially is to go to all the places i've written about so there's rome there's, um it is essentially a um a, a murder mystery in a way. Uh, Dark Heart is um, uh, addresses uh, corruption um, and a particularly nasty, nasty cult, um, which I based on one of the previous Roman emperors called Elagabalus, and I've heard um, of him, yeah, and um, it was a pedophilic cult. Um, you know, um, and um, and it was one of the ways of keeping this small group of influential men under control. This sort of this horrible, horrible uh, taboo, but undergirding that was uh, eventual plans to take over uh, and and insert themselves into the line of succession for the emperors. Um, my hero is a magistrate and who begins, uh, who is solving a series of murders involving these young boys. Um, his son is, um, he's estranged from his son because he's divorced from his wife. Uh, her father has uh, raised the child as his heir, so there's some, some conflict there. Um, the heroine is uh, Medicaid, a, uh, a doctor. Uh, oh. she's, she's originally from, from Britain. She's apprenticed to a, uh, a doctor who, unbeknownst to her, has been helping the hero 
with with essentially elementary sort of time period appropriate forensics. Um, but he's murdered. And uh, so this is how the hero and heroine meet. And they, uh, they then sort of work their way through um, identifying sort of the, the key members of, of the cult. And um, during that period, they, yeah, they fall in love. Um, but their um, happily ever after sort of takes lots of twists and turns before it gets there. So I like uh, a story that has a, another story in it, so that the love story isn't the main thing, but it is part of it. I really like something like that. Well, to to me, it's sort of from from my my perspective, is the falling in love doesn't necessarily equate to a happily ever after because. Um, for uh, for me as a for me as a reader, for me as a writer, I've got to be satisfied that by the end of the book, that the hero and heroine are uh, not only better versions of themselves than when we saw them. They're you know they're stronger, braver, more resilient, more resourceful. Um, but the hero and heroine are, are stronger together as a couple than they would be as if they were apart. So I like to put them through a, a trial by fire, as it were. Um, so when, when the book closes, you know that they're, they're able to face whatever future obstacle comes their way. So, uh, so yes, the, the um, adventure and suspense part is, is integral to that. Yeah, I, lo I like a lot of suspense. I also like a lot of emotion in a book. I think I like writing emotional things. Um, I like putting my reader through the ringer a bit as well. <laughs> a little bit of tension is, is good. Well, it, it is, and and this is this is the um, the wonderful part of romance as a as a genre, is because you are guaranteed that happily ever after in the end. It means you can um, explore um, really deep, dark, emotional themes. Um, you know, of, of love and loss and identity and um, all of all of those things um, in a way that is is ultimately hopeful and optimistic, because mm -hmm. there is the happily ever after. There 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 is an end point which is better than the beginning point, and and that's that's so valuable. I think as as a as readers to recognise that 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 is life. Um, Along with Gwen's story that I've got obviously is that she knows about Tamlan. So in a way, she knows it's not a happily ever after, or she thinks it's not a happily ever after, but she doesn't know if it's true or not. She just knows what she, you know, has been told that's come down in legend and myth and everything. But primarily it's a story of a lot of battles because although it's Gwen telling the story, there's a lot of Arthur in there and he has a lot of battles. <laughs> I sometimes get a bit fed up writing battles. <laughs> quite hard to make them different each time and I will say it's very hard when you're because she's first person I'm telling it in the first person right. so I can't give a point of view of anybody else at the battle I have to maneuver Gwen so that she sees a view of the battle <laughs> which is quite difficult to do because she's a, a dark age queen she doesn't re shouldn't really be there but she's very I, firm and she does go well that, that is a really interesting point that I, I hadn't considered because I I write everything in the in the third person but again sort of um true to a, a lot of time travel uh stories they are told in the first person mm -hmm. has, has that been the uh, the most challenging part of writing the, the series well, is the first it wasn't person? to start with it's got more complicated in book five because she's been there quite a long time so there are various extra characters whose storylines i have to keep going but all from her point of view so i'm having quite sort of not really struggles I'm just finding it a little more difficult in book five but I also because there are a lot of battles in it because I used there's a ninth century monk called Nennius who passed down a list of 12 battles so I'm working I'm using Nennius I mean it's highly likely they're nothing to do with Arthur but when you write an Arthurian book I think the readers expect a certain amount of the law that they know I'm not getting Lancelot so they're going to get Nennius and the 12 battles <laughs> these battles they have to be bloody and horrible because they're hand to hand fighting with swords and axes and there's a lot of nasty things going on but I wanted in particular 
to, to make sure, because Gwen is looking at all these, these battles from the 21st century point of view, and I wanted it to be very clear that she does not like them, she does not approve of them, but well, she doesn't not approve of them, but she's horrified by what goes on. So there's a lot of emotion and upset and because also she knows that essentially at the end, Arthur doesn't win against the Saxons. He might get a short period, but we're the English. She's English. She's a Saxon, really. I mean, she's descended from the Saxons mm -hmm. because they, that's how we got the name of England. So she knows that whatever Arthur does, even if it only lasts 50 years, after that, the Saxons will be back. So she can see these battles really as being yeah. pointless. Yeah. And I wanted Ooh. to make sure nobody thought I was glorifying that want to glorify it i'm looking forward to seeing how how you wrap that up in the end because there's there's some really intriguing possibilities mm. um so... i've got some ideas at the end i'm a, I'm a pantser so i never 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 plan anything i just sit down and write so <laughs> I, I sometimes it. have it little bits in my head but i can start a chapter and by the end of the chapter something else entirely has happened <laughs> i don't know do you do that um, I'm, I've evolved into being a, um, a little bit more of a plotter as, as, I've, mm. as I've gone on and mainly because I need that little bit of self-discipline and I can write a little bit faster. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the world's fastest writer. Um, so I find that helps keep me on track. But I have characters who, who I plotted a perfectly lovely scene for them. Wonderful. But they may go, you know what, I think I'll do this. And it's sort of, I always give them their head because they often come up with, with things much more interesting than, than they do, I don't they? They, they people, do. People who don't understand about writers look at you as if you're mad when you say your characters go off in directions of their own will. Because they do, don't they? <laughs> they, they do. And I, and I think... Um, as an author, once, once you once you're in a group where that is happening, um, I, I think you know that you're on to, to something really good because, um, okay, sort of, we know the story in, in the head that we want to tell, but in, in a way, um, you know, we, we are looking at actors, well, this is the way I look at it, We're looking at actors on a, on a stage and they've got a degree of autonomy in there as well so once mm -hmm. that autonomy begins to to come out then then you know you've got something that then engages the reader because it surprises you as the author well they're like real people aren't they very much yeah and I very think, very much i don't know if you do it i should i imagine all writers do it as i'm writing i can see it all like a film um happening mm -hmm. and you see it don't you because i i belong to a group called well, it's an online um, group for writers called Critique Circle. And it's brilliant. Absolutely the best writing group I've ever found. There's hundreds of people belong to it. Not everybody's active. But what you can do is you, it's, you have, I'm, I'm a paid member. So everything of mine is in a private queue. So I've only got selected people reading it. But when I first went on there, I put things in the public queue. Um, but it's all perfectly safe. So there's no, no one can do anything to it. Um, and you, you, you read and critique somebody else's work, you get points. And then when you've got points, you can put, put your own work up there and other people will read it for you. And it's been such a help. I was rubbish. I still, I'm not very good at um, hyphens and commas, but I was much worse at hyphens and commas before I went on there. <laughs> but I've learned an awful lot on there. I would say for anybody who's starting out in writing, that is definitely a group to join because they're so friendly and they're so helpful. And there's a forum you can go on and post questions and just it's just lovely. Thank you. That's all we have time for today in conversations with Elizabeth Ellen Carter. Uh, I do encourage you to like this video, subscribe, leave, leave me a comment and share it. We can build the channel and I can bring you many more conversations just like this one. So thank you very much. We'll see you next time.